Here we are then, um, Dave, a year on. And yes. we are now at, I've counted them, it is album number 66 in 54 oh. years, which is a staggering achievement. I mean, this is over an album every single year of your entire career. Were you aware that you've been as productive as this? Um, yeah, got uh, really someone else told me. I mean, it's, you know, with compilations. And uh, funny enough, as, as you mentioned this, uh, um, I suddenly found out that um, Warner Brothers, uh, in connection with Sony, around the world, had issued this album years ago, 85 times, unbeknown to me, and every other member of the band that were on it. Uh, <laughs> and with our minor percentage that we get from these records, it does piss one off somewhat, you know. <laughs> but listen, the interest and the coverage, rather than shrinking, has expanded over the last few years. Uh, this time last year when we were talking about... Um, the, the future album. The reviews were, were amazing. You know, late career highlights. Uh, impressive is the ambition and range of styles that, uh, that have been explored. And I remember when we spoke about the uh, that album, you said, oh, we've already done the next one, which presumably was yeah, this one. Right. So, and in fact, it's funny enough you should mention that. <laughs> Yeah, Dave's actually already done the next no. one as well now. Regulus has done one as well, too, I might add. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you have actually got another album ready to go. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we've got an idea. We've got lots of tracks all done. I mean, we just have to uh, polish them up a bit. So I think there's about 40 minutes, I think, Dave's done so far. Well, it's 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 just phenomenal, actually, when you, you sit back and take it all in. Your work rate is just off the scale prolific uh so what was the objective then when you set to work on stories of time and space i mean if if you can remember last year so what what were you setting out to achieve that was different from what came on the previous album um well we were trying to make it sound a bit idea wise differently weren't we well i think the the, the inspiration came because we, Rob Godwin did the book about the, the history of, of Hawkwind and Space Rock, and that was, uh, that was the kind of inspiration, wasn't it, to find it, wasn't it? And we, did, we got back into the ideas about Space Rock and, uh, and all the things, the things that, that led to Space Rock, you know, like the classical music at the time and the, the technology, at, at, you know, in the late 60s. And, you know, and Are you still delving into science fiction literature i.e things that are produced now or are you actually drawing on you know, the hundreds of books and articles that you've actually consumed over the years um no at the moment i'm reading what am i reading i'm uh, where is it i'm reading the last rainforest of britain <laughs> <laughs> which is nothing to do with science fiction whatsoever. <laughs> what about you, Maggie? I mean, you've made these uh, made these stories up yourself, really, haven't you? For the, the, yeah. the, the there's the there's the there's a man who's got to get rid of all the human waste into the chuck them into the suns and uh, burn them all, burn it all up. And the the <laughs> album that we're doing now is uh, about uh, the uselessness of. Um, human beings basically <laughs> yeah, well, that's, another subject. that's another subject so <laughs> we're on the world stories of space and time yeah yes yes because i want to say that the the whole landscape when you think about it has changed regarding the well, science fiction sci-fi space rock i suppose if you want to add that onto it yeah back when you began Science fiction of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, people would sort of look at you and think, oh, God, nerd or, or mad. Um, you know, if you started talking about anything to do with the universe and space and other worldly beings. But today, as we are now, it's a completely different landscape because people want to believe. People aren't afraid of these things. So when you think back then, did you ever think that we would get to where we are now? Yeah, a lot quicker, though. Um it's very slow, 
that's the trouble because I mean communicators, which are are on mobile phones now, um, of just getting uh, little apps that you can go to a foreign country and speak into your phone and immediately it translates and the person you're talking to would translate. Things like that, we were, you know, should have happened uh, at least about fifty years ago. <laughs> well, when you think about this, I mean, you, you touch on the, the subject of what happens. Mars. I mean, you, you writing songs about, you know, beings on Mars and whatever, people would dismiss you as some sort of grown-up kid, you know. But now we are sitting there looking at daily images and videos sent back from the Mars rover with 4K quality video. And, and of course, life was there. I mean, you know, if you put it into perspective of the universe, you know, when Mars died out and uh, then Earth was probably uh, full up with volcanoes and things happening. uh, And, yeah, and what what happened to the life that was on Mars? Did did they leave? Uh, When you look at all the uh, cities uh, like 5,000 years ago that are all destroyed and and, uh, who knows what's happened. I mean, the James Webb Telescope, I mean, publishing these incredible deep space pictures and images. And now they're they're telling us that the the Big Bang, you know, the beginning of, of everything, it didn't actually happen. So, so that's you know everything that people have believed for for what well, the scientists have believed for decades and decades. That none of that ever happened. Now, all about time and movement and expansion and and so on. It opens up a whole new world of of potential storylines yeah. for albums for you and songs. More knowledge, it? it's, it's knowledge, isn't it? Really, uh, to gain more and more knowledge, but it's a very slow process. That's the unfortunate thing. Will we make it? I, as well, because all the problems that are going on around the world as we speak, you know, like COVID, look at yeah, the problems yeah. that's caused uh, long term. Uh, look, I mean, we've got wars going on constantly and, you know, the threat of wars. Uh, will we actually progress forward, Magnus? Well, it does <laughs> say <laughs> now we're all planning to go and live on Mars with, rather than uh, keep this, uh, this planet okay. You know. So we're talking about the the album and the opening track of the the album our lives can't last uh, forever so it, it, it's almost like we're talking about the end of days before we've actually even got into to track two but the, the yeah, it's a very doomy beginning to the album isn't it but and then it kind of cheers up as we go along <laughs> Yeah, I was the the lyrics were interesting actually. The the mirror sees the the lines on the face. It's no disgrace. Our lives can't last forever. Is this actually just a reminder that obsession with uh, youth or trying to be young, looking young, is pointless, and you should just basically embrace age? Um, well, I can't speak for Dave, but I just, I think it's just basically there's a sort of assumption that that we can. We, as in a band, can go on forever and ever and ever, and uh, and that Dave's invincible. But and I think it's, he's just pointing out that we that uh, that all things come to an end eventually. You know? That's the way life is. Uh, everybody thinks they can last forever, and. Uh... They can't. In terms of the music, it sort of lulls you into thinking that the uh, album's going to have more of an ambient vibe, but it's it's very much far from it because uh, when we move on to uh, Starship, uh, One Love, One Life, I mean, this is has got the real feel of classic Hawkwind space rock. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a, yeah, again, it's a story about um, going off on a spaceship to another world, isn't it, really? Heaven, the, the actual uh, planet heaven, where everything is yeah, yeah. just like Utopia, where everything is, all the streets are paved with gold. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the simple message in that, wasn't it? Use your life well, don't waste it away. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all these songs have uh, got good... Uh, psychology in them, don't they, really, I suppose? That's the thing. They're all messages. Isn't that true, Magnus? <laughs> they are messages, philosophical messages. I think it's, it's interesting that you said it was space rock. I thought it had quite a sort of jazzy kind of... Uh, Disco. Kind of almost, yeah. sort of, almost sort of <laughs> Latin feel to it. You know. yeah. Galaxy 117, where's that? 
because it's a place just like heaven. Oh yeah, well, where is it? Well, is uh, that the farm? If I, if only. <laughs> <laughs> but you succeeded in doing that in producing a song, which, and this is from a listener perspective. Seven minutes forty. So when you look at the fact that there's a song running for seven minutes forty, you'd be thinking, yeah. You know, by the time it gets to the end, I'll be glad it got to the end. But when you get to the end of that, you actually feel like you wish there was some more of it. Uh, well, there was actually that. It was cut down a bit. It lasted that was ten minutes. It lasted wasn't it? ten minutes in actual fact. And uh, was, we are on the same wavelength. Which boy here. in the band? There was a boy in the band. I I can't name who it was. Said. I think it's a bit too long, actually. I think we'll have to cut it down. <laughs> do, do you know what? That is a note that I made on the when I was listening to it, and I thought I said I've just literally said, "How do you make a song that's seven minutes forty feel like it's ending too soon?" <laughs> so there you go. That can be for the deluxe edition, Dave. Well, there are. There's uh, there's also what's it? Um, one of the other songs quite long, isn't it? Eh? Is it the tracker? That's quite long. Traveller. Traveller in space and time. time. Yeah, that's Seven quite minutes. long. That's, that's been cut yeah. down. That's about 12 minutes long, that was. Yeah. It's amazing what you do with two chords. Well, I have said this before. <laughs> you can play one chord for half an hour and never get boring. So. <laughs> what are we going to do while we're here? So yeah. where, where were you going with this? I noticed the, the androids are playing up again infringement of their that's rights. Right, yeah, so yeah. is this... Are the, are the androids basically the, the your observations of the general public these days just kicking off? Or? Uh, well, no, they're, they're, well, I mean, they're obviously um, robots that work on the machine and uh, they, uh, as they become more humanised, they, they, uh, be, they form a union. That's what they, they, they form a union, all the androids do, and then they go on strike because uh, they want to be maintained correctly and... Uh, the engineers have made them a lazy, and uh, <laughs> there is logic behind these words, you know. <laughs> uh, the tracker again, that's an interesting topic. Hearing sounds uh, from the galaxy, we uh, found, and you mentioned in here, which was quite interesting uh, so many objects floating in the universe. And that's quite right, actually, because you touched on a point that made a news story not that long ago, I think in the last week, where they've been talking about there being over a million pieces of space junk floating around the galaxy. Well, I mean, the tracker is actually looking for life, really, receiving um, communications from uh, various planets and trying to make sense, hoping that, um, you know, there is life on a planet millions and millions of light years away. Uh, which he does, he eventually finds Do, there is life. And then it's a worrying situation. What's going to happen when the, they uh, make contact with him and arrive here and take over Earth and eat all the humans? Because they, <laughs> they, they live on the humans. <laughs> uh, I mean, the thing is, though, you, you do think, don't you, the more... Yeah, the more we travel through you know, our lives and, and time, whatever, that it is just a matter of time. And you hope that you're here and around and it's going to be in our generation where there is something found. Well, one hopes uh, it might actually change the way we all are. Then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Till I found you then, searching for the, the hidden door that unlocks all of our problems. Yeah. Maybe into hell or beyond, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there's a, the, the hell just reference at the end, isn't it? But, I mean, the, the the beginning of that song, which which we actually was on the last album, wasn't it? But uh, I was just watching this. It was just from a romantic film with uh, it's uh, James Mason and Ava Gardner, and uh, she goes. They spend eternity together on this cap, uh, on this ghost ship, you know. And uh, and at one point she says, "Oh." It's as if we're under a spell outside of time, you know. Uh, 
God, I did time. Yeah. And, right. uh, and I just thought, God, that sounds like a Hawkwind lyric. Was there an intention when you were putting this album together? I mean, I know we have instrumentals uh, here, Underwater City, uh, The Night Sky, Regenerate, the, uh, the, the Black Sea. Was, the, was there an intention to have this album feeling and sounding more like a ro- space rock album than the last one? More, more ambient, you mean? More um, No, more full-on well, rock, actually. More full-on well, space rock, because the, the feeling was, I, I thought, you know, as we were moving through the album, the instrumental tracks uh, came like at the right time. You know, you're ready for something to sort of settle you down before you had the next surge of menace and energy. Well, yeah, it's all about dynamic, I think, with Dave. You know, it's it's there's no... You don't get any light and dark if we're just pounding away all the time, you know. So it's 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 and it makes the rocky bits more more effective when you've got the the ambient bits in between. You know? And when you uh, look at the the concluding tracks in Frozen in uh, in time there and Stargazers, which uh, now you talked about jazz, and I thought that had quite a jazz feel to it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It, I mean, we do like going off at tangents like that, don't we? I mean, Magnus can actually play some really good jazz keyboards that so <laughs> he ought to do more often, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I mean, you know, the difference is, uh, I, well, okay, when we did the the live show at the Albert Hall, um, when you did your, your acoustic uh, number, wasn't it? I mean, the visuals on that are absolutely fantastic because we've got these robots, undersea robots, on an underwater city. And it is quite spectacular when you've got a combination of things like that on a screen when, you know, people go to see us perform sometimes. Uh, yeah, so that's the one track that we've played live so far yeah. off, off of that album, isn't it, that we, we put in last year? I think my favourite track actually was Traveling Time and Space because it had something for me that felt like a bit of, it had a bit of a David Bowie vibe, a bit of Heroes. Yeah, uh, that's because of the uh, a feedback guitar, the duet, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's right, yeah. Well, the funny thing was I actually had got this, bought this guitar, I always wanted to get one, wouldn't it? The sustain yeah. guitar. Sustain yeah. guitar, you know. <laughs> What a world. Another door opens up when you've got a sustained guitar so you can do these wonderful sustained duets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, br- that's brilliant. Now, the album cover is interesting. Now, this is always an event, your album artwork. People can't wait to, to see and comment. And I put a picture, uh, I put some of the images, uh, rather, on... Uh, some of the social media platforms which draw lots and lots of comment. People loving it. And in particular, they liked the very Art Deco piece, which I think is the back yeah, of the yeah, album. Stuart. Yeah, Stuart, the artist, uh, he's a very good artist, actually. Chris got in touch with him, didn't you? Go on. He's in Holland. He's he, really good. Yeah, very, very good artist. I thought, yeah, the the back cover's great, isn't it? It kind of reminded me a bit of Roadhawks. Uh, you, you've got a copy of the booklet that goes with it, haven't you? Yes, I did. It takes you back to the days and that when you have those conversations about, do you remember when you used to go and buy an album? And you'd come home and you'd put the album on and you'd sit and you'd, for the duration of the album, you would devour everything that was on the covers. Yes, that's right, yeah. Well, quite wonderful because we can actually do what we used to do, <laughs> can't we? Well, you can open it up and, wow, look, you know, there's uh, plenty of things to see. Uh, it makes it interesting. Um, people say, what, why, why, what does it mean, the clock at that time? <laughs> what? This is the question that everybody wants an answer to. Yes, I've been told it's a very cosmic reason why it's ten past ten. There is, a mystic, there, right? is a there is there is a reason. So, uh, but I think everybody's got to ponder on that for at least a year. <laughs> <laughs> what before you tell anybody? <laughs> yeah, they think twenty twenty four is twenty four minutes past eight. They don't realise it's the year. Yeah. It's quite. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a weird one. So it's it's nice to have our fan base because they are the kind of fans who like to have a proper album. They'll listen all the way through, the, all the gaps, all the the way it all fits together is really important. And 
and it is you're supposed to sit down look through the book look you know yeah. skin up on the uh on the cover you know and and, and enjoy the whole experience you know? have you ever considered then doing a spoken word tour so where you no <laughs> <laughs> that was that was very uh, quick and unequivocal of, would that not appeal to you sit, sitting on stage and going through stories and looking back over this career stories and poems you mean you nearly did that for your solo i nearly did it yeah uh, and yeah it was quite an undertaking because all of a sudden you, you you suddenly say yeah that's a good idea and then you suddenly realize um you've got to have all good stories and some really good poems to read and retain people's interest for a long period of time and take questions from the audience that you don't want to give answers to <laughs> and things like this. <laughs> is there a question that you dread people asking you um, ask, what's your favorite yeah what not really i mean we've had lots of questions <laughs> over the years and uh it's such a career. 55 years ago this August that you debuted at the All Saints Hall as Group X. And you used to say that our aim is to freak people out without needing to take acid. Is that still the case? Um, I don't know, maybe. It's what do you think? Uh, you're younger than me. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're trying, I mean, take people on journeys with the music, don't we? Uh, I mean, yeah, then in that era, different eras, uh, people take different uh, drugs and it was uh, different 60s, 70s, totally different, really. Well, yeah, most of them did take acid before they yeah. listened to it, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> and now, I mean, you know, you think, well, yeah, we can take people on journeys with uh, our music and our light show. Well, it is with the with the lights and the projections and the and the and all the stories like it. It, it should be for for the audience. It should feel like they've been through a, a, an experience without necessarily having to take the mind expanding drugs to go along with it with uh, it. And this was a story you talked about over time. The um the night that you, you did drop some acid at the roundhouse two hours before going on uh, and delaying your arrival on stage and when you took to the stage you said it was amazing because all the audience turned into skeletons. Yeah, it was a most uh, not a very nice experience I might <laughs> it, it also happened that I uh I'd uh, at the roundhouse, they had nice salads there, actually. And um, I'd had this salad that had beetroot in it. And as I was eating the beetroot, I suddenly freaked out because I thought I was chewing my tongue. And I <laughs> tongue, and it was well, and sort of things like hunky. that's not the sort of thing one wants to have happen here. You know? I think that Lenny was panicking, wasn't he? Yes, well, yeah, we had a, the, I think we had quite a few panics on stage. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, so it does sound it does sound amazing. So too, by the way, does uh, reading books on Turner paintings. Uh, what was it? The Who's ex manager's place, uh, and, yeah, and, and cool. finding all the all the all the images, or interacting with with each yeah, other. Yeah, the funny thing is, yeah, yeah, all those images. Obviously, he painted these pictures. I mean, you can see them. I can see them still. Uh, I think uh, in you know the old psychedelic artwork that um people used to take acid to you uh, you know you can see all these things once you've seen it once didn't we use a yeah. richard dad painting for somnia yeah we and did richard yeah. dad used to have all of the, the fairies the fairies and yeah. the mad things because he how well did you did you know eric clapton back in in the day yeah these were the times when you were, you're busking the early days and you said, you know, we used to pop around to Eric's flat for a, for a cup of tea. And this is when he was with with Cream. So how how did you come about to be friends with Eric Clapton and end up popping around for tea in the afternoon? Well, because <clears throat> we used to hang out in Richmond in a cafe called the Low Burge Cafe. And I mean, around that time, Il Play Island Jazz Club. Before he was in Cream. Uh, before he was in Cream, I, I'm, you know, we were sort of 17 years old, sort of quite young, listening to lots of old blues musicians with Brian Lemon Jefferson and Big Bill Brunsey and people like that. Um, and we used to, uh, that was it. Uh, 
Didn't he break your guitar? No, he, he got drunk on cider and fell over backwards and sat on his guitar. <laughs> <laughs> we were sitting in Richmond Park, actually. Or was it Strawberry Fields? There's a place at Twickenham called Strawberry Fields. Didn't you teach him some chords? You yeah, I, teach him chords. Him, I taught him a few chords to play, blues. Yeah. So that's how. So uh, can uh, can we just get that straight? You actually taught Eric Clapton some what? blues chords. Yeah, yeah I, I know, but I mean, um, I, I had known him quite a long period of time. So, so you see, these are the type of stories that people would lap up. By the way, you're sat on yeah. stage just going through a general conversation, and there are so many of these these moments, like about people forgetting, maybe or not even knowing around that period of uh, levitation, I think it was, back in the early 80s, uh, Ginger Baker joined up for 18 months. Yeah. Courtesy of uh, Hugh's wife, Marion, wasn't it, who worked in his um, management office? Yes, we had two-thirds of cream in our band, didn't we? Uh, (laughs) Not together, but... (laughs) How did it pan out? I mean, because he did have a reputation for being difficult or it was quite an interesting reputation yeah. so how, how did he get because he was there for 18 months well i got on with him okay actually uh i mean uh what he was a world-class drummer i mean yes and uh you got on all right with him yeah i uh, i got on with him fine and um we're all eels. We all yeah. have to shout and no, no problems at all, really. <laughs> and, then, and then forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> Who was it that ended up cracking him over the head with the pool cue? Uh, that actually, was me. That was yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> he, kicked, he kicked my dog. No. He was well, trying to kick my dog to death, so I hit him with a pool cue. And then anybody would, wouldn't they? Yeah. No, that's um, that's absolutely unforgivable. I did want to touch on on something which is quite interesting. Now we've seen a lot of elite sports people, right, who've become vegetarian and and vegan and swear that it helps prolong their careers as elite athletes. So do you think that you're reaping the benefits yeah. now for your you know natural? Existence. Well, I think so. Magnus is one as well, aren't you, Magnus? So, you're vegan. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but you're really healthy, aren't you, Dave? And you've been a. Uh... <laughs> yes. You yes. Do. I think uh, if everybody, uh, uh, we'd have a, a lot healthier world if uh, everybody actually stopped eating uh, meat and fatty foods and, and such. animals. Yeah, basically. And everybody in the heart. Place, didn't it? They all had problems. They yeah. all ate meat. Funny thing is now, I mean, when you look at television adverts, uh, mainly they're all about uh, either cremation, <laughs> uh, people being overweight, <laughs> eating crap food, and um, yeah. having heart attacks, having, having heart strokes. attacks, uh, problematic things with the national health. Uh, it, it, it is quite an insurance, basically, isn't it? Painful cremation. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so good. (laughs) It's not so good watching television these days. And they last for 10 minutes as well, which pissed me off too. (laughs) So tell me, the the expectations, do you have expectations when you release new albums? Do you sit there and you think, right, for this to be considered a success for me, it has to get into the charts and do this and we have to sell this many... Or does it simply not matter? You're just fulfilling what your birthright is, basically, after the career, that which is just to continue producing music. Uh, yeah, we're artists. That's, yeah. that's what we are, artists. Producing artists that we're creating uh, music, uh, sounds, instead of uh, painting pictures with brushes. I think we're quite lucky really in the, in the sense that we we don't have any interference from the record company or, or anyone else really. We just make exactly the records that we want to make and and then if people like them that's great and if they don't we don't really care. Do you have you found that there's a new Hawkwind fan these days? Um, maybe younger, do you, are you seeing any uh, younger people at your gigs? Is there an audience that wasn't there once but is now there now? Has this evolved? Um, yeah, over a period of years. I mean, it's the policy that we've always hoped for 
because, you know, where, years ago when we used to play under the flyover in Notting Hill Gate, um, and I, it was it was all the poor end of Portugal Road, and just across the road there was the reggae shop that used to sell all these fantastic old reggae records, and they had two huge great speaker cabinets outside blasting out reggae music. Uh, everybody, age group there was from 80s, to three-year-olds were all dancing around. And I, th I used to think, wow, that's that's really the way to do it, isn't it? That's what music's about. Yeah, and we, you know, and we get people who bring their, their children and their grandchildren. Yeah. And, yeah. In recent years, there's a lot more women come to your gigs than, say, in the 80s. You know, all the sort of levitation, sonic yeah. attack, the rock time. It was mainly young men, wasn't it? It was all sort yeah. of lads in the audience. Yeah. But now I would say it's a... Yeah, yes, it's less male oriented uh, audience now, I think, isn't it, yeah. over the last few years? Yeah, which is a good thing. 